Welcome to Old Testament History, Chapter 3, Session 18A, The Book of Ruth, A Literary Great. I'm grateful to God for all of you putting up with me and my idiosyncrasies so far in this class. But somewhere in there, I trust, have been the sparks of inspiration from the Lord. This is a huge work indeed. 65 sessions so far in Old Testament history, chapters 1 through 3, and equaling over a thousand pages of transcript. I testify that not by my brain, nor by my talent, but thine, O Lord, has this all come together. There have been many epiphanies and crack-a-dawn revelations that are woven throughout so that week after week we've witnessed the awesome beauty and depth of God's Word, the literature of the ages, the highway to understanding you, God. I have poured out my heart and knowledge to all of you, giving you my best understanding of the Scriptures And I am blessed to say I think it's some of my best work. And I am proud of what Ren, Rene, and I have been able to give you. And, uh, curiously enough, I fit in with Ren and Rene even better than you think. Because my mother's maiden name was Ren, R-E-N-N. Meine Großmutter kommt aus der Stadt Krimmelschau, das liegt im Bustestland Sachsen, Deutschland. My grandmother came from the town of Krimmelschau, which is in the state of Saxony, Germany. Ah, uh, how about that? I am part Wren. Even my daughter's middle name is Wren, R-E-N-N. Oh, the mysteries of the Lord. <laughs> now, I'm trying to stay around as long as possible, but one day I will be gone, and it is my sincere wish that those who travel after me will not have to cover the same ground, but will be able to take what I've given and build beyond my knowledge to arrive at new plateaus and vistas of God and His Word. We are coming to the end of chapter 3 at this point in Old Testament history. But the law administration won't be ending for another thousand years or so. The history of God's people, though, will be entering a new phase of the kings and the prophets. And that will begin February the 7th. We'll take off that week in between. We are almost done covering the theocracy of Israel, which began with Moses in the book of Exodus and continued through the rest of the Pentateuch, and the books of Joshua and Judges, and we'll finish in 1 Samuel. Last week, we covered the last five chapters of the book of Judges, which actually, chronologically, fit into the first chapters of the book of Judges. The genealogical information given determines that. The theocracy of Israel extends beyond the book of Judges with Eli and Samuel, into the book of 1 Samuel. Last week, we had to painfully witness some of the worst of Israel. But there is one more book of the Bible which occurred during this judge's period, and it reflects some of the best of Israel. And that's the book of Ruth that we're going to cover tonight. I will be doing a summary of the book. For a more detailed teaching on the book of Ruth, I recommend Reverend Wayne Clapp's class titled Ruth, the Romance of Redemption. And I can give you the the URL or the web address for that if you want. It's available on the web. So, Ruth, chapter 1 and verse 1. Here we go. Now, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. This book of Ruth 
was, quote, in the days when the judges ruled, unquote. So it actually could have been part of the book of Judges. However, just like I couldn't segue from Judges 17 through 21 to the book of Ruth last week, I don't think the prophets could either. (laughs) It was too much of a contrast between when there was no king in Israel and when the judges ruled. Between when every man did that which was right in his own eyes, and on the other hand, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, who revered God. Judges 17 through 21 was about what was done wrong. Ruth was about what was done right. It opens with a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. Whoa, there's that town again. And suddenly I realized it was there staring at me in the face, and I didn't see it. Bethlehem, Judah was the town where both the bad Levites came from last week, which were the main characters in the portrayal of the worst of Israel, Judges 17 through 21. But Bethlehem Judah also is the setting for the best of Israel here in the book of Ruth. Therefore, here we see evidence of another spiritual thread, just like the string of wrens in this ministry, There's a string of accounts in Bethlehem, Judah, that runs in the Bible. It's another continuity that's proof of the divine authorship of Scripture. David was from that town, as well as the Messiah. So, this is about small-town Israel. Big-town Israel, of course, involved Jerusalem. But small-town Israel was portrayed by Bethlehem in Judah. In our nation, we have a similar dual theme portrayed. Big town America is what happens in New York City or Los Angeles or Chicago. We have TV shows about that. Small town America is portrayed by Peoria, Illinois. (laughs) Have you heard the expression, does it play in Peoria? For a long time, that town has been a metaphor, a stereotype, a bellwether for mainstream America. Bethlehem in Judah was the same in the Bible. It was a sub-theme of the Christ-line theme, for only God knew at that time that these books were written, that Bethlehem, the city of David, was where the Messiah would be born. Now, Some iconoclastic people object to our commemoration of our Savior's birth. Well, here we have proof it was significant. Bethlehem is where Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife, was buried. Bethlehem was where one of the judges, Ibzan, was from, and from which he ruled. David was from Bethlehem, and Jeroboam was from that area, too. So, both the most influential figures of both the kingdoms of Israel, David and Jeroboam, came from the same area. Verse 2, And the name of the man was Emelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the, the name of his two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Benjamin Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Amalek, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilon died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Verse 6, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. So back at Bethlehem, Judah, the famine broke and they were having good crops. They could have bread. So Naomi and her two daughters-in-law were in the worst situation one could be. They were widows in a foreign land. 
In most countries of the ancient world, there was no safety net, no provision for the poor, sick, or destitute. Because of this, most were forced into begging, slavery, and in the case of women, prostitution. It was a very unfair world, except for Israel. There were provisions codified in the law that accommodated the poor, the widow, and the stranger. In this case, a famine persisted in Moab, which is on the east side of the Dead Sea, in the modern country of Jordan. The weather there is similar to Albuquerque, New Mexico, except the rainy season is in the fall, and they get a bit more than Albuquerque. They do grow wheat in Jordan and in New Mexico, but it's risky because of the erratic precipitation. For example, in New Mexico, they only get sufficient crop yields every two out of three years. The effects of droughts are devastating. But Naomi found out that conditions had gotten better in Judah, which was about 45 miles northeast and on the other side of the Dead Sea. Verse 7. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. That find rest meant to remarry, because they were young enough to remarry. They could still bear children. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Verse 10, And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. And if I should say, I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should bear sons, would you tarry for them till they are grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieves me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. That's that idiom of permission. So, what Naomi is referring to here, them waiting for her to have sons, is the concept of what's called leveret marriage. This is discussed in Deuteronomy 25. Deuteronomy 25 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 25, 5. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. Now, that's the practice of leveret marriage. Now, this may seem strange or even incestuous to us today, but back then it was an honorable thing. It was commanded by the law. Many ancient cultures had arranged marriages, which affected the thinking involved in this process. We today marry the people we fall in love with. In arranged marriage cultures, they fall in love with the people they marry. Also, many ancient societies accepted polygamy, and this was one circumstance for it. Therefore, it was normal, if necessary, to marry one's sister-in-law as a second wife if one's brother, her, their husband, had died. We know that women were not afforded the same rights in ancient culture as they are today in most countries, but Israel was one of the exceptions in which women had greater rights and protections than normal. Consequently, while leveret marriage was possible in other cultures, 
In Israel, it was required by the law of Moses. Leverett Marys provided a safety net for women. There was an undercurrent of compassion and mercy in the law that was not found in other countries. These prevented destitute women from resorting to slavery or prostitution in order to survive. So the first reason for Leverett marriage was to provide for and protect widows. The second reason was to provide for continuity in the inheritance of the land. When the husband died, the land needed an heir. So if there were no children yet in that marriage, the brother was obligated to give the widow an opportunity to bear a son, to be an heir for her deceased husband's property. That would keep the territories that Joshua allotted to each tribe intact. If the brother refused to do this, it was publicly adjudicated by the elders of the gate that that brother might be shamed. Deuteronomy 25, 7 goes on to say, And if the man liked not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that his shoe loosed. So he'd get a bad reputation. And your name was everything in that culture. So if the brother refused, the right to marry the widow could be accepted by a kinsman, which would keep the land within the family and tribe. There were some instances where the law did not stipulate all the possibilities. In that case, things were extrapolated from similar rules and applied. The succession of the next of kin was provided for in Numbers 17, 1 through 11, in which a man died with no sons, but who had daughters. It was then stipulated that the daughters would inherit the land in that case. However, they could only marry within the tribe, as Numbers 36, 1 through 12 stipulated. So that would keep the territory intact. Everything would still be in that tribe. So Numbers 27, 1. Numbers 27, 1. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. And if he have no daughter, then you shall give the inheritance unto his brethren. And if he have no brethren, then you shall give his inheritance unto his father's brethren. And if his father have no brethren, then you shall give his inheritance unto his kinsman that is next to him of his family, and he shall possess it. And it shall be unto the children of Israel Israel, a statute of judgment as the Lord commanded Moses. So, now while I'm talking about the Law of Moses providing for leveret marriage, I might as well cover what the Law of Moses says about buying and selling and redeeming land. In Israel, land was not sold forever to the buyer, like it is here in most countries, except if that land was in a walled city. Then it was in perpetuity, like we do. But agricultural land outside the city walls had been divided up between the tribes by Joshua and to maintain the territorial integrity of each tribe's inheritance. The land was not sold in perpetuity. It was more like leased until the next Jubilee year. Leviticus 25 talks about this. Leviticus 25 verse 13. In the year of this Jubilee shall you return every man unto his possession. And if thou sell aught any to thy neighbor, or buyest aught of thy neighbor's land, you shall not oppress one another. 
according to the number of years after the jubilee thou shalt buy of thy husband and according to the number of years of the fruits he shall sell it unto thee so the price of any land was prorated depending upon how soon the next jubilee was so if the next jubilee just happened and it's going to be 50 years till the next jubilee that land is worth fifty dollars let's say now they can buy it back any time in that 50 year period but when they buy it back they won't buy it back for the original selling price of fifty dollars the selling price would be prorated as to how long it would be until the jubilee so you could buy it back halfway through for twenty five dollars that's how it worked verse 16 according to the multitude of years thou shalt increase the price thereof and according to the fewness of years thou shalt diminish the price of it for according to the number of years of the first stuff he sell unto thee so then the concept of the kinsman redeemer comes up a few verses later in Leviticus verse 24 and in all the land of your possession you shall grant a redemption for the land if your brother be grown poor and has sold away some of his possession and see that's what happened probably with Ruth's husband they were from Bethlehem Judah but there was a famine so he probably had fell on hard times because of the famine and sold his land and moved to moab then he was there in moab they were there for 10 years and during that time emelech died so this is what happened he probably sold the land verse 25 if thy brother be grown poor and has sold away some of his possession if any of his kin come to redeem it then shall he redeem that which his brother sold so he could buy it back a kin person could buy it back from the buyer and this was axiomatic undisputable if they wanted to buy it back they could buy it back verse 26 if the man have none to redeem it and himself be able to redeem it if you dig up some treasure that somebody buried or whatever then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it that he may return unto his possession. But if he be not able to restore it unto him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee, and in the Jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return it to his possession. So this is the law's provision for bankruptcy. Because sometimes stuff happens. Now, after noting these legal matters, we return to Ruth chapter 1. Naomi had advised her Moabite daughters-in-law that their best chance to find a new husband would be to go back to Moab, their homeland. The Jews would be less likely to marry a Moabite widow. Therefore, one daughter-in-law opted to go. Verse 14, they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. But Ruth did not go back home to Moab and its pagan gods. Ruth stayed with Naomi. This speaks volumes. For that family must have lived their faith while they were out of the country. And Naomi especially. For Ruth not to leave her but to declare to her what she said. For instead of going back home, Ruth speaks one of the most beautiful, pure, and endearing statements of devotion recorded in all of literature. Folks, in my opinion, this ranks among the top ten statements of all time. Ruth one sixteen. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. 
thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Wow. I can't bear to dilute that statement with any commentary. It is so beautiful. It'll stand on its own. What an ideal, virtuous woman Ruth was. No wonder she caught Boaz's eye. <laughs> A woman like that is indeed more valuable than rubies. Verse 18. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? In a way, the returning of Naomi from Moab, a pagan territory, would be like someone returning from the dead. Everyone in the village would have heard about it. How her husband, who had formerly resided in Bethlehem, had taken Naomi and the family to Moab and died there, as well as her two sons. And now Naomi was returning to Judah, where the true God was worshipped. A true daughter of Israel had come home. But then there was something else remarkable, and that was that Ruth, her daughter-in-law, was forsaking her family and country and the gods of Moab to come to Israel. I am certain that Naomi told her relatives all about what happened, as well as repeating the beautiful oath of love, piety, and loyalty that Ruth had made to her. I'm certain that the relatives received her, Ruth, with open arms, and news of this circulated around the whole village. Both women would have been welcomed into the local synagogue. So you see why I say that this portrayal in the book of Ruth of Bethlehem, the quintessential Israeli village, was the best of Israel. But it gets even better. Verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. So it was springtime. They synchronized the Hebrew calendar with the barley harvest, for the law required a wave offering of the first fruits of the barley harvest during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So if the barley wasn't looking like it would be ripe in time, the high priest would declare a second Adar. That's like a leap month in the lunar calendar. Then a few weeks later, the wheat harvest began after that. Chapter 2, verse 1. Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Emelech. His name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn, or that's King James for grain, after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. The law of Moses had provided for the poor to survive by stipulating that the corners of the fields be left behind for the poor to harvest. That also included making only one pass through the harvest for the grain. Everything else left behind was for the poor, the orphan, and the widow. This is talked about in Leviticus 19. Turn to Leviticus 19, verse 9. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Also Deuteronomy 24, verse 19. Deuteronomy 24, 19. 
when thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again and fetch it. It'll be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. And when thou beatest down thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, or for the widow. And when thou gatherest the grapes off thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterwards. It'll be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. The process went like this. You know, one person cuts the wheat, lays it in bundles. It's like cutting long grass with a long knife. Now, we've all had to cut grass growing in our flower beds, haven't we? You grab a bunch with your one hand and cut it off at the ground with the other. Do that over and over. Well, they laid the bunches together with the seed heads in the same direction. Then another person tied the bunches together so they could be easily carried. One must be careful not to be too rough with the seed heads because the wheat berries could drop off and the law said you can't pick them up. (laughs) They must leave them where they lay for the poor to glean. And also when one cuts the grain, one only makes one pass through the field. So there'd be a few upright stalks left behind. And then also some stalks that might have broken off that are laying along plus any wheat berries that fell to the ground during the process. All this, plus the corners of the fields, were to be left for the poor to glean so they could survive. Then the sheaves are brought back home, allowed to dry thoroughly, and then the wheat berries are knocked off the stalks into a container by rubbing them with one's hands or hitting them against the sides of the container. This is called threshing. When the grain was temporarily stored until it was winnowed, Winnowing was throwing the grain into the air and catching it on a blanket and allowing the chaff to be blown away. Threshing and winnowing on a larger scale was done on a threshing floor, which was a raised hard surface, usually on a hilltop exposed to the wind. The grain sheaves were trodden underfoot or walked on by cattle and then winnowed. A threshing floor was something the whole town would take turns using. The harvest time was a time of partying and rejoicing, for the harvest meant that there would be good eating for a while. Barley was usually for making bread or beer, and wheat was used for bread. The barley stalks were woven into baskets or thatch for rooftops. Now, I need to mention something about beer. Uh, John Shanehite, in his research, thinks that what was called, quote-unquote, strong drink was beer because they didn't have distilleries back then. The process of distilling spirits was not yet invented. So strong drink, he thinks, is beer. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I think he's right. But anyway, chapter 2, verse 3. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap, her happenstance, was to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the kindred of Amalek. Well, it wasn't by chance. God had a hand in it. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. So he's not like an absentee owner. He's out there with the crew. All right. And he greets them. The Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. Then said Boaz to his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? He noticed Ruth. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It's the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Boaz had noticed her right away and asked, Whose young woman is this? He knew who his workers were, but did not recognize her. Now he assumed that she was married, so he was asking who her husband was. Then the manager told him who she was. And her favorable reputation had preceded her, because it was so praiseworthy that she had committed herself to stay with Naomi and come to Bethlehem, and also to worship the true God. I'm sure the townspeople had talked about that, and that's how Boaz knew. Verse 7, And she said, I pray you, 
Let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came, and hath continued even from the morning until now. And she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let your eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So now we see the goodness of Boaz extend kindness to this widow from Moab. He told her to stay in his field, and that he had charged his servants to not bother her, and even that she could drink the water that was provided for his crew. Verse 10. Then she, Ruth, fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in your eyes that you should take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger? Verse 11. And Boaz answered and said to her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. So Boaz knew of Ruth. He, he just didn't know who she was until they met. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Boaz had heard about Naomi and Ruth because the news had spread around town. And now he got to meet her in person. He was impressed, and he had compassion upon her and was kind to her. Verse 13. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached to her parched corn, and she did eat and was sliced, and left, that left, she left some over, I'll explain. The parched corn, in verse 14, is dry roasted grain. The modern term for it is frika. This was discovered by accident when soldiers had burned the fields of their enemies, and the people later had tried to salvage what was left, and they discovered that when the burnt shells were removed, the toasted, semi-ripe green grain left was edible and delicious. So that's what this was. The REV Bible commentary also reveals some important details in verse 14 that let us peer into the ancient past and see this in our mind's eye. Boaz said, Come thou thither. Since Ruth knew her humble status, she probably was sitting separately from the group at mealtime. Boaz welcomed her to join them and offered her what they were eating, which was bread dipped in wine, vinegar, olive oil, and spices. I'll continue to read from the REV commentary here. Their comment about, So she sat beside the reapers and he, because that ties together. The fact that Boaz, a wealthy landowner, would sit and eat with his workers is still more evidence of the quality of man that he was. He could have afforded to eat much better a meal just than just bread and roasted grain, and many wealthy men would not eat with the workers. But Boaz did not separate himself that way. While there was no evidence, he tried to blend in as, quote-unquote, one of the guys. Neither did he stay aloof from them. And then, quote, he passed roasted grain to her from the REV Bible. The Hebrew verb translated, quote-unquote, passed, is only used here in the Hebrew Old Testament, and its meaning is debated, which explains the diversity of the ways it's translated in the English versions. So King James says, reached her, gave her is a few translations, served, a few more translations, passed, a few more translations, offered, a couple, handed, and made a heap of, or heaped up. All those different translations in all the English versions that's listed here in this REV comment. 
The word is used in modern Hebrew for, quote-unquote, pinched. And although the verb could have meant something different in ancient Hebrew, if the modern Hebrew is a guide, it might refer to some of the grain being pinched apart or portioned out to her. And then finally, quote, had some left over. So Boaz gave her such a large portion that she could not eat it all. Boaz likely knew that ahead of time and was trying to help her, and that theme continues in the next verses. So that's a lot of insight from the REV commentary. I thought it was excellent. Chapter 2, verse 15. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. Let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephath of barley. Now, how big is an ephath? Well, an ephath is 10 omers, right? So you know what that is, right? (laughs) It's approximately, an ephath is approximately a bushel or 50 to 60 pounds of grain. That was one day's work. And she took it up and went into the city. And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave it to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where have you gleaned today? Where did you work? Blessed is he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought. And said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is... Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Naomi said unto her, The man is a near kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabite said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all the harvest. Verse 22. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. Verse 23, So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and to the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So things got even better. The grain harvest lasted all seven weeks between Passover and Pentecost in which there were 42 work days and seven Sabbaths. So, if Ruth got about a bushel a day, she ended up with around 42 bushels. That, supplemented by homegrown vegetables, could take care of them till next year's harvest. But now, things get even better, because Naomi hatches a plan. So, instead of like in the back of Judges when things kept getting worse... Here, things keep getting better. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Now, to seek rest meant that you get a husband. And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, He went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. So this is at the end. This is near Pentecost now, at the end of the season. And he's going to be winnowing all the accumulated grain there at the threshing floor. It's done in the evening many times because that's a little bit more windy. She hatched a plan. Verse 3. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your raiment upon thee. And get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the man until he have done eating and drinking. And it shall be, when he lies down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. See, the landowner during winnowing would sleep by the pile of grain to guard it. All right? Verse 5. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Verse 6, And she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, 
he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. Now, <laughs> she uncovered his feet so they would get cold, <laughs> and he'd wake up after a while. Now, some commentators have inferred sexual innuendos in some of the terms used in this section. But that would have been totally out of character for both Ruth and Boaz and this entire book. Remember, the book of Ruth is in direct contrast to what happened in Judges. It was an example of things done right. So I doubt there was any hanky-panky. And in fact, the REV commentary discusses this at length. Verse 8. It came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid. He, he woke with a start and turned himself. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, who, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. She was at his feet in a humble position, and she identified herself, and then she asked him to spread his skirt, his wing, over her. During the wedding ceremony, one of the traditional rituals is for the man to cover his bride with his talith, which is his fringed prayer shawl. So in short, she's asking him to marry her. But there's far more involved in this than meets the Western eye. For us, when thinking about the possibility of marriage, we would only consider it if we loved each other. But in ancient Israel, a marriage was more of a business transaction. They were used to arrange marriages in which love may not even be a factor. And even though Boaz had showed Ruth generosity and respect and mercy, what she was doing was for survival. But there also was a business side of it because there was a parcel of land involved. Now, there's some debate about the exact set of circumstances, but the most straightforward and common one is that Naomi's husband, Emelech, had a parcel of land that came to him as his inheritance. And he worked it, but then he sold it before he went to Moab. Remember, chapter 1, verse 1 said there had been a famine, but the land was not, quote-unquote, sold in Israel in perpetuity, like we sell land here. In Israel, at the Jubilee year, all the land reverted back to the seller, as Leviticus 25 specifies. But Amalek died. So normally, it would go back to his two sons at the Jubilee, but they both died. So, at the Jubilee, it would be transferred to the closest next of kin. However, it could be redeemed at any time by a kinsman before the Jubilee by paying that prorated price depending upon how soon the next Jubilee was. Ruth was the widow of one of the sons, and by rule of leveret marriage, she would come connected with the land. The purchaser that redeemed it would have to marry her, and she would become their second wife. So, when she asked Boaz to marry her, this all was involved. It was like a business deal. There were two laws involved. Number one, regarding redeeming the land sold before the Jubilee occurred, paying that prorated price. And number two, the law regarding leveret marriage. Verse 10. And he said, I'll have to think about it. No, he didn't. He said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, insomuch as thou hast followed not young men, whether poor or rich. Now, if we have the genealogy of Boaz right, he could have been over 70 years old. John Chainhigh thinks maybe 90. And Ruth would have been in her 20s or 30s. The um, Talmud said she was in her 40s. That's why Boaz replied to her this way. Verse 11. And now, my daughter, he says, fear not, 
I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit, there is a kinsman nearer than I. The fact that Boaz accepted so quickly makes me think that he'd already been considering this. I mean, it's obvious that she had caught his eye because of the way that he'd been so generous to her. And the fact that he personally had given her that large portion of parched corn on the day they met. He had heard of her devotion to Naomi and of her reverence to God. That had been the talk of the town. Then he saw her character and how she worked so diligently in the field, gleaning, plus how she carried herself. Ruth was a real gem, a virtuous woman indeed. Verse 13, Tarry this night, he said, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then I will do the part of a kinsman to thee. As the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. So he promised he would make it happen. She lay at his feet till the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came to the floor. And also he said, Bring the veil that you have upon you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured out six measures of barley and laid it on her. And she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who are you? Because it's still dark. And she told her all that the man had done unto her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will go. For the man will not rest until he hath finished the thing this day. Naomi's plan was coming together. How excited they must have been. So now witness the goings-on at the city gate where the town's business was transacted, overseen by the elders of the gate. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat down there. Behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit you down here. And they all sat down. Then he said to the kinsman, Naomi, that has come again out of the country of Moab, sells a parcel of land, which was our brother Amalek's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then let me know that I may redeem it. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And the man said, I'm going to redeem it. Verse 5, then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must also buy it of Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, Ah, I can't redeem it. I can't redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. So the deal is done. Verse 3 was translated that Boaz said Naomi was, quote unquote, selling the land. Well, now, if Naomi owned it by virtue of being the deceased owner's wife, then she and Ruth would not have been in that situation that they were in because the land would have been managed by a steward in Emelech's absence while he was in Moab, etc. But it had been sold. Since Boaz used the word redeem, it meant the land had been sold to a third party, and Naomi was trying to get a kinsman to redeem it before the jubilee occurred. So that has to be involved in that, quote-unquote, she's selling it. All right? She's trying to get this deal done. But there was this extra stipulation of the leveret marriage. 
that said that Ruth came along with the land. And so the nearest of kin did not want to marry Ruth and raise up seed to inherit it. He probably had sons already and did not need to beget any new ones to dilute his inheritance any further. That's what, quote-unquote, mar my inheritance may have meant. Verse 7. Now this was a matter in former time in Israel concerning the redeeming and concerning changing, you know, changing owners. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe, gave it to his neighbor, and then this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore, the kinsman that said unto Moas, buy it for thee, and so he drew off his shoe. Now, this use of the shoe is not the same thing as the shoe in shaming the one refusing to do the responsibility of leveret marriage and then getting spit on. No, that was the responsibility of the widow's father-in-law, and he was deceased. So the shoe is an entirely different custom, which was when land was sold, the shoe represented the right to walk upon the land as its owner. So the one yielding control of the land took off his shoe and gave it to the buyer. They had the right to walk upon the land. Verse 9, And Boaz said to the elders and to all the people, Your witnesses this day, that I bought all that was Emelech's and all that was Chilin's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. You are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. And the Lord make the woman that is come unto thine house, like Rachel and like Leah, which two did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in Ephrathah, and be famous in Bethlehem. And let your house be like the house of Pharaoh's, to whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. Now, Pharaoh's and Tamar was an example of leveret marriage that was carried out in spite of Judah. <laughs> but anyway, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, she was his wife, and when he went in under her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And it was. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thy old age, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom, and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David. This was the ultimate honor for Ruth's son. He was in the Christ line. Now these are the generations of Pharez. Pharez begat Hezron. Hezron begat Ram. Ram begat Amonadab. Amonadab begat Nashon. Nashon begat Salmon. Salmon begat Boaz. Boaz begat Obed. Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David. So that is the book of Ruth in the quintessential city of Israel, Bethlehem, Judah. Bless you. Let's take a break.